Kind of a combo program tonight. We'll talk about the status of the Middle East, security and all of that, and then a little bit of that refugee controversy. Welcome into my state of mind. I am Dan York on this Friday evening. We've had uh, a hell of a week. You know, this time last week, I was going down to URI to call a ball game as the public address announcer for the basketball team. I get down there and I look at my smartphone and I got alerts going off out the wazoo and Paris is under attack and before we even start the ball game, we're offering a moment of silence out of respect for those who've been lost in these attacks and the world seemed almost upside down and the crowd was somewhat stunned and now here we are a week later and we've had a week's worth of radio programs on WPRO weekdays noon to three arguing about refugees. We have rallies on refugees. We've got questions about security and so that's our focus for tonight in a program which don't tell anybody we record Thursday afternoons for Friday evening. Hopefully the world didn't explode between last night and tonight. I trust that it did not. Let us give you at least at our production time the latest available update in terms of the Paris security response. The French prosecutor now says the mastermind of the Paris terror attacks was killed in yesterday's raid in Saint-Denis. Fingerprints were used to identify Abdel Hamid Abaoud's body, which was riddled with bullets. Parisians welcomed the news. Prosecutors also say the woman who blew herself up when the raid started was Abaoud's cousin. The manhunt continues for attackers who got away, including 26-year-old Salah Abdeslam. The Daily Mail obtained surveillance video that shows a gunman opening fire on a cafe. You can see people running for their lives in a hail of bullets. France's Prime Minister warned legislators today the next attack could be with chemical or biological weapons. He wants to extend the nation's state of emergency three months, giving security forces the power to search and detain suspects without a warrant. Okay, so that is the latest coming up. Uh, it was the latest as of late yesterday. Coming up a little bit later on to join my guest will be a state representative who says, hey, we ought to be more open about refugees, which is the disposition of my guest who's kind enough to have stayed over, uh, sleepover from, from overnight, uh, Charles Chaz Freeman, Jr., who is a senior fellow at Brown, and you're a diplomat. You have been, you've been all over it. Brief resume for everybody, just in case. Um, started out in India, um, was uh, Nixon's interpreter in 72 in Beijing. Um, what an experience uh, that was. Oh, it was memorable. Um, and uh, uh, op opened uh, the liaison office in Beijing in 73, uh, was a country director. Actually, I was acting U.S. Commissioner for Refugees for a while. Uh, so the you end, get it. end of the 70s, uh, dealing with the Vietnamese vote, vote people. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then I uh, ran the embassy in Beijing and the one in Bangkok. Uh, and then I did, uh, uh, I did uh, four years commuting between Pretoria and Havana, uh, dealing with Fidel Castro, trying to get him out of Angola and the South Africans out of Namibia, which much to everyone's shock we actually did. Uh, and then I got a call from George H.W. Bush asking me, if I would be his ambassador in Saudi Arabia, which he assured me was a place that nothing ever happened. And uh, nice. I went off, and uh, uh, pretty soon I had 550,000 technical advisors in uniform. Uh, Norm Schwarzkopf was technically my military assistant. Uh, so uh, it was probably the ambassadorship of the century, and then I was assistant secretary of defense after that, before I went straight. And I've been in business uh, for 20-some years now. You, uh, I mean, that's a resume that it just, just speaks for itself. You had a little challenge, though, because you were nominated for an intelligence position, and it got all jumbled up based on your disposition about Israel. That's not my subject matter tonight, but give me 30 seconds on it, because it'll give people a flavor about your way of thinking. Um, I was out of government. Uh, I'm outspoken. Um, I was very concerned about uh, the direction in which Israel and our relations with it were developing. Uh, I thought Israel was setting itself up in a kind of uh, national suicide, uh, that we were aiding and abetting it, we were enabling it like you enable an alcoholic by, you know, you give them the car keys and you're responsible for what happens. I thought we were responsible. 
I thought it was irresponsible not to speak out. I did. Uh, that wasn't particularly appreciated by the right-wing uh, Israel lobby, uh, and they went after me quite viciously. And since, in order to do this job, which was the chair of the National Intelligence Council, I had to have public credibility. I couldn't do the job amidst sure. controversy, so I withdrew, and, and uh, I've been happy ever since. Just as a follow, because people are going to be curious, is it Arab sentiment that drives your perspective, or no. tactical Israeli strategy that drives your sentiments? National interest of the United States. Okay. Come back and talk to me about that at some sure. juncture, because it's a whole, that's a whole big, important conversation. But we've got one going on now. Interestingly enough, Israel is on the back news burner while the rest of the Middle East is a tempest in a teapot, Syria being the worst zigzag of problems caused, of course, if we're going to be honest about this, by what happened in Iraq yeah. and, and, and President Bush's decision to go in a second time, Colin Powell having to talk about yellow cake and uranium, and here we are again. Now, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I didn't jump up and down and say, don't go, don't go. I thought Saddam Hussein should have been more forthcoming. He might have cooked his own goose. That's a pedestrian viewpoint, I'm sure. But let's not kid ourselves. What we're dealing with right now is created the ankle bone and shin bone are connected to the knee and femur bone, correct? Absolutely. All right. So your Middle East expertise tells you what about what we're dealing with with ISIS, Daesh, as it's called, and all of that right now? Uh, on one level, we're dealing with uh, a deep accumulation of resentment and a desire for revenge uh, for the many deaths that we've inflicted, not just the United States, but the West generally uh, over the course of a century. But in this century alone, we've killed over a million people in that region. And what we needed to l take, the lesson we needed to take out of 9-11 was if you bomb people, they'll bomb you back. And if they don't have aircraft, they'll walk a bomb in a suitcase in on you. Or they'll invent a way of delivering it, like turning an airliner into a cruise missile, which is what they did. That was an IED, if you will, uh, in uh, crashing into the, the world uh, uh, trade towers. So um, we basically need to find a way to call off the escalation, counter-escalation cycle of violence that we had a good deal to do with starting. So you were called to Saudi Arabia. You're in the middle of it. I was. Did you feel the same way when you were in the middle of it? Uh, in those days, that was a different time. You know, uh, Saudi Arabia was a peaceful place when I arrived. Nothing ever did happen there. But what we did in Iraq, Ah, later, uh, what yeah. we did. No, I, I think, you know, um, I was a wartime ambassador. Um, I agreed with the decision not to go to Baghdad. I thought it was wise. At that time, Vice President Cheney actually made the case most effectively for why we shouldn't go to Baghdad. And oddly enough, he predicted what would happen when later on he advocated that we do so. Uh, namely, it would be an ambush and we would end up uh, having to take responsibility for all sorts of things we're not So the first one, no, the second one, yes. Yeah. And now here we are. The first, the first war, uh, the war to liberate Kuwait, was about stopping the annexation of a small country by a large one. The second one was gratuitous. We had no real reason to do it. Uh, and the intelligence narrative that was put out had no basis. And by the way, many conservative folks argued that it was gratuitous and, and to this day think it sure. was. So it's not a liberal versus conservative no, it thing. Um, long story short, though, as if we could in a few minutes, Syria is an absolute mess. We've got a void that has been created there, not only by what's developed post the Iraq war, but in my humble judgment, a president who just doesn't seem to be able to make a clear-cut decision and then is arrogant about his non-decision making. Uh, yes, no, or let's put it this way. Can we agree that last Monday was not his best day when he, when he called the, the Paris attacks a setback and was more animated about saving refugees than he was about being responsive to what happened in Paris? 
tone matters, doesn't yeah. it? I think in this case, the problem is the United States, not just the President, the United States doesn't have a strategy. We don't relate, you know, Iraq has been partitioned and part of it is in a state of anarchy and under the control of Daesh. Same thing is true in Syria. We don't relate the two. We don't have any way of dealing with the two. In the meantime, the, con the Congress of the United States, which has the authority, sole authority under the Constitution to authorize war, sits back and tries to push off all the responsibility on the president. We are, con we are at war, and there's no authorization for it, none. So we have political games being played, both sides of the aisle, I think, uh, and the issues are too serious to allow that to go on. Is it, I feel so silly asking this question. What's the end game? Ah, uh, as far as I can see, nobody's figured that out. You know, th there are two questions that you ought to ask before you go to war. One, how am I going to end this? What achievement will uh, enable me to proclaim victory and end it? And second, why should the other side accept that? You know, George, a George W. Bush, the second Bush, uh, proclaimed mission accomplished. He forgot no war is over until the enemy accepts defeat. Mm. The enemy did not accept defeat. The enemy is resentful and revengeful. And uh, we poked a hornet's nest in there after us now. All right. This refugee conversation is, is a complicated one unless you do a constitutional analysis. A state rep who is on one side of the argument will join our conversation when we come back. Stay with us. What I've said and what I stand by is we'll take our lead from the president and the federal government. All of this depends on the details and we can't let ourselves get caught up in uh, the politics or, or any hysteria. You know, we'll look at it when it comes and I'm not gonna weigh in on hypothetical decisions because it's just too important. You know, it's interesting, that was a couple of days ago where the governor was talking about whether or not she'd be open to refugees from Syria coming here. Since then, she's been articulating a more open position that she'd be more aggressive in accepting refugees. But last night on the program, uh, my excellent guest, Mr. Freeman, who's had a, who you should Google, he's got a resume of, uh, in Middle East expertise suggested that it's a pretty moot question. Now, Aaron Rogenberg is here, state representative, first term from Providence. Welcome to the Thank broadcast. You, uh, I thought we were going to be able to schedule a debate on this issue. The Republicans and those who oppose refugees coming to America made themselves unavailable after their rally uh, for yesterday's production of tonight's show. Um, but you'll be pleased to know that uh, Mr. Freeman gave us a pretty quick essay on the constitutional issues. Why don't you give us a 30-second version on this notion of whether governors can prevent Syrian refugees from coming? Well, there are basically two factors here. One is the Constitution gives the federal government sole authority over immigration. And that's just been reaffirmed by Supreme Court decision in Arizona. States don't have the ability to interfere or usurp the power of the federal government in that regard. And the second thing is Americans and people who live in the United States have total freedom of travel. Uh, people in one state can't prevent people from another state from coming in. So all of this is uh, an argument about much, much ado about nothing in terms of uh, the governor's authority. They don't have the authority. So I ask you, in Thursday rally, you had the early, you were the pregame show, right? You one thirty. you guys rallied to what? Open, it, it was o open a, our, what was your, what was your position? On, well, it was a really great uh, gathering of faith leaders, the diocese, um, the Jewish Alliance, the Council of Churches, of um, refugee organizations and, and leaders, Dorcas International, and actual folks who've been through the, the refugee vetting process to talk about that, uh, legislative leaders, and the goal was to, to uh, number one, I think push back on some of the rhetoric that we've been hearing, including from uh, elected officials here in Rhode Island, um, and to uh, push for and reaffirm that Rhode Island uh, is a place that welcomes and accepts uh, people, particularly people who are oppressed and who are trying to flee from uh, 
uh, violence and terrorism. Okay, so that's interesting, and I want to I want to carry the conversation further. Did anybody mention anything our our good senior fellow has to say? Which is, by the way, it's a stupid conversation because the well, Constitution says the governors don't have any role in this anyway. Well, I agree. I mean, that's it's not even a debate. It's very clear cut mm -hmm. constitutionally. This is a federal decision of whether and where to accept refugees, right? Um, I would push back that it is a stupid discussion. I mean, I wish we didn't have to have a discussion. The discussion was started when uh, certain voices started using rhetoric and saying, no, we can't have them. So I think having the discussion now is important for two reasons. One, um, while the state level governors can't decide whether or not to take refugees, I think they have some power to either make things very uncomfortable or comfortable for them. We heard uh, certain Republican governors are doing just that. Bobby Jindal in Louisiana signed an executive order basically saying we're going to arrest any Syrian refugees that come in, something along those lines. Um, in uh, Indiana, we saw um, their very uh, aggressive stance um, when a Syrian refugee family was coming. And so in response, uh, the governor of Connecticut, our neighbor, said, we'd love to have them. We'll welcome them. And so I think there are, there are issues there that, that okay, so having, can make a difference. Have, but have, I also think, Dan, uh, not to interrupt, sure. I think the other thing that matters here is the rhetoric. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert like you on some of these issues, but ISIS is, is smart. They, they're able to think ahead. And so for anyone to think that that attack that they did um, did not anticipate and, and maybe even one of the reasons for it was the backlash that they knew could happen. Um, I think that the rhetoric that we're hearing is a great tool for ISIS. Our, our president has been saying that again and again. It's a, it's a propaganda for them. It's a, it's a recruitment tool. They want a narrative that is the West is at war with Islam um, because that helps them. And so when we hear state legislators in our state using language in other words, that- short answer, we're taking the bait. Exactly. Is, exactly. Yeah, do you agree? <coughs> I do agree. Um, and let's just remember, um, Syria is a country of 22 million people. 10 million of them have been displaced. Uh, 300,000 of them are dead. Over a million of them are wounded. Five million kids haven't gone to school for four and a half years. Um, we're talking about a human catastrophe on a huge level. And we had something to do with causing that, as we've discussed. So we can't just turn our back on this, and I agree. Uh, that we need to have a discussion uh, and we need to face up to uh, to these realities and do it in a charitable manner. All right, so you know what? I'm going to I'm going to keep both of my uh, my guys here. When we come back, I want to talk about whether that rhetorical disposition actually is going to matter on the Washington debate and the vote that we had yesterday. Stay with us. So look, I know there's a lot of Dan York show fans and I say that with affection and, you know, with these who think that I've lost my mind uh, this week by suggesting that we've got to be more open about this refugee conversation. You might, for some reason, think that I would be, you know, in a hell no, you know, uh, mindset. I, I'm trying to think this thing through, and I think cooler minds prevail in times of trauma. Uh, but these guys make sense when it comes to thinking through this refugee situation and then the constitutional analysis, and I'm glad for both of your perspectives. Uh, the state representative is making a point that I think is something we got to pay attention to, and that is despite the constitutional provisions that call for the feds to be calling the shots on whether states can even think about accepting refugees from Syria or anywhere else, you're suggesting that having a more comfortable environment for that is is an important thing. Before I ask you about that, do you think that matters? I think it matters. I think it matters a great deal. We have uh, we have brought in perhaps a million refugees in this century. As far as I know, we haven't had any trouble with terrorism from them, from the refugees. Uh, if we go on with Islamophobia and making life uh, for Muslims in our country or in this state. Uh, difficult and oppressive, they're going to react. You want to play into Daesh's hands, that's how you do it. So the very Syrians that are running from the terror might be the ones 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years from now who hold the resent, who hold a serious grudge if they don't already. 
and you got a bunch of uneducated kids because they haven't been to school in a long time. It's a, it is another boiling uh, World War III-ish continuation type of problem. What do you think uh, is the benefit of your pro of your rally yesterday being open about a refugee program here? Will do to whatever the feds come up with if they come up with anything, because we've got another Washington debate that's going on there. In other words, creating the, you, you wanted to point out that creating the environment is an important thing, regardless of federal law and or regulation, correct? Yeah, I think that's true. Elaborate. Well, I don't know if what, uh, if the outpouring of, of support for refugees that we're starting to see in Rhode Island, if that's going to have an impact on the federal legislation around this or, or well, federal decision making. Outpouring is, is a relative term, you know. I, or that I saw yesterday at this, yeah. at this rally. Well, how big was your rally? Uh, it was big. I don't Big know. rally? Hundreds? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, you know, the state house retired. Yeah, well, all politicians hmm. think they've won the, the election when they get 300 people to show up at their rallies and find out they got 1%. So I don't mean to minimize how many people are with you. Um, and I, I'd be a fool to think that my radio phone lines actually are reflective either. That's a fool's judgment. But there's a this going on right now, and everyday people right now, uninformed, I think a lot about the nuances of this, are well, thinking, you're nuts. I and think they're looking that at you thinking, ooh, that guy's too smart yeah. for my predisposition. Mm. <laughs> I think that that's, I've, I, I've gotten a lot, of, since I've sort of come out on this, I've gotten a lot of phone calls from folks who have concerns, and you know, I appreciate where those concerns are coming from, but I've seen a pattern that they're really, in large part, seem to be coming from a place of inaccurate information about mm -hmm. uh, about you were talking about the process earlier that vetting process that is incredibly thorough it's it is a up to two year process there are multiple agencies and departments they have to be refugees have to applicants have to be vetted by the national counter terrorism center by the fbi's terrorism screening center by the state department the department of defense the department of homeland security Homeland Security, the yeah. fingerprints, all of their biometric information is, is screened. It goes oh, on and on. Uh, uh, good. Um, <laughs> you're going to be frustrated because we've got to continue this next week. Let me ask you, bottom line, what do you think is going to happen in Washington? The federal debate is legitimate. We should have it. What's going to happen? Um, I fear we'll do the wrong thing, which is to play into the hands of Daesh by closing the door. If we do that, we validate their thesis that this is a war on Islam, that we are part of a religious war, which is not our intent and never has been, whatever mistakes we've made. I fear, I fear we may not be true to our standards as Americans. Ditto? Absolutely. All right. Uh, more discussion on this next week. It's two-tiered the JV game, which is the state debate, which is almost irrelevant, and the varsity game, which is the Washington debate, which is very relevant. You should be involved in both. Guys, thank you very much. Final word when we come back, stay with us. You know, this, this conversation about, about the Middle East is complicated enough in terms of what we do to get the ISIS thing resolved, which is incredibly difficult. The refugee question is really going to clog up the whole thing and we need to be looking forward and we need to be informed on this debate and I'm hoping that these programs the last couple of nights uh, will help you in that regard because I'm working with it just like you are and we'll get right back to it next week on the radio at noon on WPRO and right here on the TV. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend.